you very much. It's, uh, as, as uh, Johan said, there's your, uh, it's, um, I have a number of connections to Sweden. It's always a pleasure to be here. There are a number of friends in the audience, and uh, I hope they'll still be friends after the talk. Uh, there are also, I also have one son who lives in Sundsvall, and uh, I should be going there tomorrow to see him and my two grandchildren. So I can cheerfully say to any of you, if you want me ever to come to Sweden again, I will say yes. <laughs> because uh, I have a lot of reasons to be here. But uh, on top of that, and that's what the purpose of today, is to see if I can get you on side. You're a very rational country. I've for a long time been impressed by the uh, Swedish approach to alcohol control, which is much better than ours in the UK and probably the best in the world. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try out on you today uh, a, a talk which I've only given really once before, which is to try to raise the challenge that scientists have in thinking about drugs particularly drugs which are currently illegal, but which may well hold the key to understanding uh, significant aspects of human neuroscience and also may offer new treatment opportunities. So I hope that you will agree with me by the end of my talk that this is something that's worth doing and maybe help me try to make the kind of changes that are necessary. And maybe Sweden could lead uh, the world in terms of this. But before I get on to that, just to make sure you all know exactly who I am, I'm a psychiatrist. I don't know if the joke goes down in Swedish, but with a name like Nut, there weren't many options. <laughs> it clearly does. Uh, I went into medicine to do research on the brain, and I've been very fortunate. I've managed to achieve my goals, and uh, uh, I think I've certainly done as, as much as I could have hoped for. I've worked in the USA. I ran the alcohol research ward at NIH for two years. Uh, before coming back to England, but mostly I've worked in the UK. I've had four children, as I say, one of which now lives in Sundsvall, and um, he's improving the quality of the soccer up there. Uh, and I, but more importantly, they've all survived teenage, and that's been quite a challenge, uh, them and their friends. I've seen a lot of things as they've gone through teenage years that uh, I hoped I wouldn't see, but it's made me a lot wiser about what young people do and the harms that they may come to. And the other thing to say is I was the UK's chief advisor in terms of the harms of drugs for 10 years uh, until I was sacked in 2009. And, and that sacking really is the beginning of the discussion. Um, it caused a bit of a stir. You can see this is the front page of a weekly newspaper. That's me um, being throttled by the Home Secretary. I guess you'd call it the Department of the Interior head. Uh, it's a great caricature for many reasons, not least. It makes me look like a doctor with a white coat. Um, we don't wear white coats in psychiatry in Britain, I think. Uh, the book of cannabis is falling from my grasp, you can see there. But the key element uh, in that particular caricature are the scales of justice at the bottom left. And you see the scales of justice, and the caricaturists have summed up the debate very well. Because you see on the left-hand side of the scales, beer and cigarettes. On the right-hand side, you see uh, some plastic bags with strange green chemicals in. And they've said beer and fags are worse than the green chemicals. And essentially, that's what I was saying. I was arguing that the hysteria that was being whipped up in Britain around drugs, like mephedrone, was actually uh, wrong in terms of the relative harms they produce, but also actually a deliberate ploy by the government to avoid tackling the big issues uh, of harm, which are tobacco and alcohol. And I'll just give you a few examples of what the government said is why I was sacked. They said I was getting involved in policy, and it's a strange thing, but you might imagine that the senior scientific advisor would be interested in policy, wouldn't you? But... <laughs> They said I was giving mixed messages, and this is a health warning to you. If you, if you think that I'm going to lead you astray, you better leave now. I said horse riding was more harmful than ecstasy. Now, that is true, and I won't spend any time discussing that at present, but if you look at the data, it's clearly the case that riding horses, particularly if you jump over fences, is more dangerous than taking ecstasy. And that alcohol is more harmful than cannabis, which is, again, unquestionably true, so much so that the government's chief scientist, who's actually a... Um, 
the environmental scientists said it was right. And they said they'd lost confidence in me, which of course is political speak for the fact that I wouldn't toe the line. So that's the background. So what about, what's the evidence on which um, I made these statements and how does this play into the question of how we should control drugs? So I want to start off with a fundamental question. Now there are a few pharmacologists in the audience. Uh, so what is a drug? And who says what a drug is? Now, this is the most important slide you'll see today, because this is what the drinks industry wants you to believe. <laughs> and this campaign has been so successful that the majority of people in Britain think alcohol is either a foodstuff or some kind of lifestyle choice, and it's not a drug. I don't know if the same is true in Sweden, but I imagine so. And the argument goes like this. Well, if alcohol was a drug, well, it would be illegal, wouldn't it? And because it's not illegal, it can't be a drug. And that circularity of argument pervades almost all debate at the level of the media, at the level of the public, and sadly, at the level of science as well. And we have to challenge that. This is what I say. This is my definition of a drug. Something a politician once used, but now regrets. Now, again, I don't, I don't know if that's true in your country, um, but in our country, every time someone becomes important in politics, they're asked the question, what drugs did you take? And one, the Home Secretary that uh, I worked with for some time, Jackie Smith, said, oh, I smoked cannabis at university, but I didn't enjoy it. And <laughs> you kind of say to her, well, why bother? Uh, and the truth is, of course, that was the only way to get into the Labour Party at the time, if you were in Oxford. But, um, and David Cameron, our Prime Minister, uh, there's a younger version of him there, he said, I did things when young that I shouldn't have. We all did. And David Cameron comes from a very privileged background. It's called Eton. And Eton is a school full of uh, rich young men. And, um, and what, what the we there are the Tory front bench, most of whom went to Eton. And what they did were take drugs uh, uh, of different sorts, but they, in common, they all began with the same letter as David Cameron's surname. So you can work out what he took, even if he won't tell you. I guess it might be K in this country anyway, but CK, whatever. So what is a drug? Well, this is what a drug is. It's a chemical which produces physiological changes in the body. And in the context of the discussions we're having, it's the balance between Pleasurable effects, desirable effects to the user, and undesirable effects or damage. And that's the tension which underpins all discussion about the drug laws. And I want to show you two examples of the, of the uh, arbitrariness on which we consider the harms of drugs in this country. Now these are two images, public images, of people who've died from taking drugs. On the right hand side, this is an image back in 19, about 1992 of a girl called Leah Betts. Leah Betts died uh, after taking a couple of ecstasy tablets on her 18th birthday, and she misunderstood the health message, and she thought if she felt ill on ecstasy, it was because she was dehydrated. But that's true if you're dancing all night, but if you're just organizing your 18th birthday party, which is what she was doing, then she wasn't dehydrated, but she drank seven liters of water during the course of the afternoon, and she eventually died of uh, brain edema from water poisoning. The guy on the left was a student at Exeter University, one of the top universities in Britain, and he died, like many university students do, after a drinking game when he lost uh, the round. The forefeet was to drink more, and he progressively got more drunk, lost more often, and then eventually lost his life. Now, what's interesting about these two individuals, they're about the same age, but Leah Betts' death was put on billboards all over the country. That's a billboard on the side of the road, sorted. She's dead, she's sorted. Sorted is the slang expression for having enough uh, pills to make you have a good evening at a rave. Gavin's death, just a little snippet in a local newspaper near where he died. Why is that? Why is there a difference? Well, the difference is that Leah Betts died of ex ecstasy, supposedly. Uh, and at the time, the drinks industry in Britain were terrified that young people would switch from alcohol to ecstasy. So they effectively underwrote 
an advertising campaign against ecstasy, which was all over Britain. It didn't work, um, or at least it didn't stop people using ecstasy, but it probably did encourage some people not to use it and to drink instead. But there's no campaign against alcohol, despite the fact as that many, many more people die of alcohol than ecstasy. So here you have the deaths in the UK. The latest data, we have 80,000 deaths from tobacco, 8,000 from alcohol, about 1,200 from opiates. Ecstasy, cannabis, methadrone, vanishingly small. Yet almost all the public dialogue about drugs is focused on the drugs which don't kill you. And as I say, I think that's, to a large extent, a ploy to avoid a dialogue about alcohol and tobacco. And the difference between alcohol and tobacco is that alcohol kills young people. Tobacco kills people in their middle to later ages. So alcohol is, I think, the real drug to target at present. And here is one of the best examples. Now, I guess you all uh, have heard of Amy Winehouse. Like, was she popular here? And most people don't realize she died of alcohol poisoning. Most people assume, because she was a pop singer, that she took drugs, which she did do, and she died of drugs. But the drug that killed her was alcohol. But there's been no public campaign to stop young people poisoning themselves with alcohol based on even a very eminent uh, and talented person like her dying. And that's because we don't want to face the truth about alcohol, because most of us drink, and most of us would prefer it wasn't as toxic as it is. And in fact, she's not alone. About three young people a week in Britain die simply of alcohol poisoning. And about 10 die of consequences of alcohol, such as traffic accidents or violence, or just uh, falling in front of cars or into rivers, etc. And one of the reasons most rational people think that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol is because no one has ever overdosed on cannabis. You cannot kill yourself, either intentionally or unintentionally, by poisoning. And the other point to make is date rape. We did several reviews of date rape in the 2000s, and we came to the conclusion that about half of all date rape is just alcohol, and the other half is alcohol plus some other drug. And the other drug could be anything from uh, hypnotic through to cocaine or MDMA. But alcohol is far and away the most dangerous drug to young women. It makes them particularly vulnerable, as you can see from those images. And in Britain, we, this policy we have of ignoring alcohol has led to one of the most remarkable, remarkably chilling changes in public health that I think probably we've seen in the last century. So what you see here are graphs of what's called standardized mortality rates. The likelihood of anyone in Britain, an adult in Britain, dying of one of these disorders, a disorder of the blood, diabetes, endocrine, liver, etc. And you can see all these reasons for dying are going down. Over the last 40 years, standardized mortality rates from every organ system have gone down, sometimes by two-thirds of what they were in 1970. And that is because as a population, we're getting healthier, and that's because medicine's getting better. But the one system which has completely bucked the trend and has gone up five times is liver disease. And 80% of that rise is due to alcohol. So we have a tsunami of alcohol-related deaths. Liver disease will kill more men in Britain than heart disease by the end of this decade. And we do nothing about it. We actually deny that it's a problem. And now, alcohol is the most common reason for death in men between the ages of 16 and 50 in the UK. And that's because the average man starts to be, get drunk from the age of about 14 on a regular basis. And there's a lot of hysteria about drugs affecting the brain. You read stories, supposedly from scientists, you know, a single spliff will kill a billion brain cells. Cocaine damages the brain. The one drug we absolutely know damages the brain is alcohol. There is unequivocal data. We've known that since we've been dissecting brains 200 years ago. But here's, here's some images from our ongoing study. We're, we're scanning people who are abstinent from alcohol, from heroin, and cocaine to understand vulnerability to relapse. And we didn't expect this, but we didn't expect people who could, could give informed consent to these studies to have brains as damaged as these alcoholics. You can see here the comparable age match controls. The damage that these uh, alcoholics suffer in terms of their brain is greater than that 
of many people with Alzheimer's disease. Unquestionably, alcohol is a brain toxin. And you might say, well, isn't it strange with so much evidence about the harms of alcohol that the governments don't do anything about it? Well, our government has deliberately avoided it. And what it's done, it's used this little quirk of epidemiology to justify doing nothing. So what you see here are a series of ways in which you can die going from lip cancer to chronic pancreatitis. And the, their mortality rates are scaled according to how much you drink. And you can see, for all these ways of dying, there's a relationship between alcohol consumption and death. Some of the relationships are very steep, like hemorrhagic stroke and cirrhosis, and others are flat. But they're all upward. The only one that bucks a trend is this one here, where in men there is a slight benefit for alcohol consumption in middle-aged men protecting against ischemic heart disease. And that was the justification why the last Labour government, the Blair government, said we cannot make decisions about intervening with alcohol because we cannot weigh up the benefits and the harms. That. <laughs> I want to compare it now with cannabis. This is another caricature. This is the Home Secretary who sacked me. This is me, by judging by the moustache in the spliff here. And um, the argument uh, was that cannabis was a more harmful drug than people had realized, and therefore should be reclassified. And I opposed that reclassification because it meant that more people would go to prison for possession and there would be greater levels of um, uh, interaction between the police and young people with cannabis. And the government were desperate because it was coming up to an election to have the policy change so that they could appear tough, strong on drugs. And they came up with this idea that cannabis caused schizophrenia. Now, actually, you're to blame for this because the only study in the world that has ever looked, been able, been powered enough to look at the relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia is a Swedish conscript study. When one year, I think it was 57, they interviewed people when they went into the army and then followed them up. And based on that study, uh, people have as assumed that there is a relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia, which there is, but it's weak. And it's, it, it's, what is remarkable about cannabis is that in the 40 years since people in Britain started being prosecuted for using it, the um, number of users has gone up 20-fold. So we've seen this massive change in the use of cannabis, massive income. And that's been true in most of the Western world. I imagine it's true in Sweden, too. Now, you might think that if there was some measurable relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia, that rates of schizophrenia would have gone up, too. But in fact, they haven't. Nowhere in the Western world has there, is there any signal that this massive increase in use has translated into an increase in either psychosis, the prevalence and incidence, or schizophrenia. In fact, if anything, these rates are falling. If you take the Swedish data at its, at its face value, then you can estimate that to stop one case of schizophrenia, you've got to stop 5,000 young men or 7,000 young women from ever smoking cannabis. Now, that is a, not a very easy thing to do using a public health measure. And to do it by criminalizing young users, which is what the government did, our government did is outrageous and, and ridiculous. But that was the, uh, the result of this over-interpretation of the cannabis schizophrenia data. This was, that was the smokescreen that they used to justify their behavior. Which raised, gets us to the question, then how should you assess the harms of drugs? Obviously, you can't let politicians do it because they will clearly serve their own purposes. And we thought long and hard, and in the 10 years I worked for the government, I tried to develop ways of transparently assessing drug harms. And after some time, uh, we came up with this scale of harm, which is published on the government website. And this derived from a, essentially a, a, a consensus meeting where a group of experts, about 40 experts, listed all the harms 
that you could ever think of that a drug could cause. Everything ranging from dying from injecting heroin to deforestation in the rainforests of Peru. And we had hundreds of sticky notes all over the room. And then over the course of the two days, we coalesced them into these 16 harms. And of these harms, nine of them relate to what the drug can do to harm you, the user, and seven relate to the harms that a drug can do to society, the harms to others. And then we did a complex, a separate m conference where we did use multi-criteria decision analysis, which I haven't got time to go into today, to rank the, the harms of all the different drugs and then to weight the different harms. And when we did all that, we came up with this graph which Johan showed you. And this was the graph that uh, was published in this Lancet paper here. And it showed, and I have to say, to, to, to my surprise, because I wasn't expecting this, the previous way we'd done it, alcohol had come up about fifth. But using this more sophisticated methodology, alcohol came out as the most harmful drug in the UK. And the way you interpret this graph is to look at the colours. The blue, the size of the blue histogram relates to the harm the drug does to the user, and the red part is the harm to society. Now you can see that the most harmful drug to the user is crack cocaine, followed by heroin, followed by crystal meth. But the most harmful drug overall is alcohol because of this vast harm of alcohol to society. And we know in the UK alcohol is responsible for over 50% of all domestic violence, child sex abuse, burglaries, traffic accidents, etc. So this enormous social harm is what puts alcohol to the top. And of course that's because it's so widely used. And that's why we should do something about it. Drugs like tobacco score lower and cannabis scores lower again. And these drugs at this end, ecstasy, LSD, etc., magic mushrooms, they, they, there are almost no social harms at all. Now, there are some harms to the user. Now, people say, well, that's just these UK experts. You know, maybe the UK is a different place to the rest of the world. And uh, so we then went away, and we did it again. And we did this recently in Europe. This was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. We got experts from 20 European countries, and we did exactly the same thing. And they... They rank the drugs, they rank the drugs differently, they weighted the drugs differently, but when you pull all the data together, you got the same result. Alcohol being the most harmful, heroin, crack. So it looks as if this is a real phenomenon for Western Europe, that this scaling of drug harms is, has a validity across uh, UK and Western Europe, and this has been submitted for publication now. So what that tells us uh, is that there is no correlation between the harms of drugs and the way in which drugs are regulated in the UK, the Misuse of Drugs Act, there is no correlation whatsoever. And the same will be true in your country too. Now, most of you will say, well, that's not surprising. We've known all along that alcohol is harmful and it's not controlled. But it does matter. And it matters because if the law is based as it supposed to be based on the harms of drugs, and if it's not based on the harms, then it's an unjust law, and people are being prosecuted unjustly. There is a man in prison in Britain for 24 years for making LSD tablets, because the judge said that every LSD tab was equivalent to a milligram of heroin, so he just totted up what the um, uh, amount of heroin would be and gave him 24 years in prison, like, which is like three times you'd get for killing someone. So the, there are real consequences to having an unjust law. But the other point, and this is the point I want to really develop in the second half of my talk now, is that th these laws have had a really negative impact on research. And that this effect has been profound, but it's been insidious. And it, most of you don't know what impact it's had. In fact, I don't think I knew what impact it was having until I decided to test it a few years ago. And some of you hopefully will have seen this review. This came out a couple of months ago. This is the, essentially the distillation of what I'm going to tell you for the rest of my talk. This, this is the evidence base to support the point I'm making, that the drug laws are hugely detrimental to research in neuroscience and to the development of new treatments. I'm going to start with LSD. LSD. 
And it's particularly appropriate to talk about these Nobel Prize winners in this room, and maybe they get their awards here, I don't know. Um, was it built when Crick got his? I don't know, but maybe not. These are, two, these are the two most important Nobel Prizes in the history of medicine, no question. So decoding DNA, and Kerry Mullis, the guy that worked out how you could tell whether your burger has got horse meat or cow meat in it using PCR. No, every, almost everyone, even at school now, uses PCR as science. Though Kerry Mullis explicitly said, I understood, I saw PCR through an LSD trip. Crips, <laughs> and, well, I, yes, that's what he says. He said, I saw the, I saw the DNA revol evolving and evolving through into serpents of DNA, through, and that's how he got the idea. Francis Crick started using LSD after he discovered the double helix. And that is why he stopped being a molecular biochemist and went off to be a, a, a professor of consciousness science in America. He actually left the UK because he was terrified he was going to be imprisoned for using LSD because he continued to use it after it was made illegal in 1964. So actually he's a great loss to British science. And it's kind of amusing now we're building a huge institute to him in London. Uh, it could have been a lot simpler if we'd actually not let him go in the first place. But. And I think Crick would support this statement by Einstein. That no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness as created. And of course that, I think, was why he was using LSD. And that certainly, Carey Mullis would support that. And LSD is a fascinating tool. It was discovered by Albert Hoffman, who saw the value. Sandow were completely convinced that this was going to revolutionize neuroscience, and they made it available widely throughout the world to ed educated scientists who wanted to study it. And in the 50s, there were about 1,000 clinical papers, 40,000 patients were studied, 40 books, six international conferences, and the results were seen as generally really rather encouraging, rather effective. Uh, but it's no longer being studied. Why is that? Well, I want to give you an example. This was a paper that was published last year, which was a, a fascinating attempt by two Norwegians to do a, a kind of retrospective meta-analysis of the LSD alcoholism trials. And they went back and they dug out the data and they applied modern meta-analytical techniques to the data. And they showed that LSD therapy for alcoholism has an effect size which is greater or equal to any current therapy. Now alcoholism, as Johan here will tell you, is a difficult disorder to treat. And this is a, so here we have evidence of efficacy for a drug which we've not been allowed to use uh, for the last 50 years. Why is that? Well, the answer is because of the Vietnam War. Because American youth did not want to go and kill people in foreign countries, and they started migrating to San Francisco and taking LSD. And the social change that this portended was so great that it was seen as a threat to the whole way in which America structured its life. And so the drug had to be banned. And the CIA and the FDA invented stories about the harms of LSD. And uh, eventually they got it banned. And they got it, it's a remarkable story because they got it banned even in the face of opposition from the US government. And this is a wonderful quote from Bobby Kennedy who was gonna be president. Uh, he would have been president if he hadn't been shot. And he, he said, why, if clinical LSD projects were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? Why are you banning this drug when it used to be so useful? We keep going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? And of course, he knew, he knew absolutely that the DEA were essentially lying about the harms. He knew that they had, this was a policy made by bureaucrats who wanted to stop the change in consciousness of America, and he knew that this was false in terms of the scientific value of the drug. But even he couldn't stop it happening. And that is exactly what has happened in the drug laws in your country and in my country. They have been made largely by people who have no knowledge about drugs, no interest in drugs, no knowledge of neuroscience, and they have been perpetuated by police and other regulatory authorities because that's what they do, this thoughtless perpetuation and I would say that this is certainly 
one of the worst examples of scientific censorship there's ever been. And in fact, I've struggled to find a worse example. I have succeeded, but you've got to go back a long way. You've got to go back to the time of <laughs> Copernicus, when the Catholic Church banned any writings and any study, effectively, of the heavens using telescopes, because they didn't want people to know that the Earth went around the sun, not the other way around. Now, I throw that out. I, if any of you think there are other worse examples, some people say, oh, what about, the, what about the Bush ban on stem cells? And I would say, well, that was bad for American stem cell researchers, but it didn't apply in Europe. Whereas the drug laws, which are now uh, fossified in the UN charters, apply right across the world. In fact, they're applied so rigorously that many people are executed for a possession of small amounts of some drugs. So I think it's an outrage to humanity, and it's been a massive, um, massively had a massive deleterious effect to science, because most drugs which are banned have very important scientific potential or medical potential. And I'm going to talk about ecstasy and psilocybin. LSD for terminal illness was a, there's a very powerful study done in the 60s showing how it can help people come to terms with dying in a much better way than opiates. And mephedrone, the drug we heard uh, earlier on. Mephedrone was being developed as a treatment for addiction, which it probably is. But now it's been banned, it's going to be very difficult for people to pursue it. And that's because the current regulations make it almost impossible to research these drugs. The regulations are completely non-selective. They stop people possessing them for personal use. They make it very difficult for scientists to work on them. And as I showed you on an earlier slide, since the LSD was banned in 1964, there's been one study. And I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong because the nature of the consciousness changes reported under SD are profound, and the therapeutic potential is enormous. So a few years ago, we decided to start doing this research in the UK. And we started working on serotonergic hallucinogens. Uh, there are some of them here, LSD, mescaline, etc. And they all are 5-HT2A agonists. And the one we decided to work with was psilocybin, magic mushrooms. And we did that for two reasons. The first is it's short-acting, so if, it was, if we found people had trouble with it, uh, then with the effects would, would not be enduring. Um, and it doesn't have the same opprobrium that LSD has, although I can tell you we are starting the first ever British LSD imaging study shortly. So we decided we'd start with psilocybin. It's a, a moderately potent um, 5-HT2A agonist. We give it intravenously because we can't afford to give it orally because it's too expensive. The, the, the regulations make the costing of these drugs so enormous. I'll just tell you a few things about these receptors. They're fascinating receptors. The 2A receptor is massively expressed in the cortex. It's particularly expressed on layer 5 pyramidal cells and on, on the fast spiking interneurons which regulate these cells. You can see them in, the, in this layer here in the, in the rat brain and the monkey brain. These receptors have evolved to control the parts of the brain which are really important to you and me, i.e. the cortex. But we don't know what they do. So we decided to find out what happens if we stimulate these receptors. And this is what happened. And, and it's completely unexpected. So this, this is one of those examples where you get the opposite effect to what you'd imagine. We assumed that giving someone cytosibing and letting them see a whole plethora of pretty colored images would activate the visual cortex. But it didn't. What it did was switch off the thalamus and switch off the default mode, the posterior and anterior cingulate cortices. Completely unexpected finding. Which itself, that finding itself, tells you that study was worth doing. Because you could not have modeled that, no one would have expected that. But until someone did the experiment, you could never have known. And the magnitude of the uh, hallucinatory experience was um, predicted or correlated with the magnitude of the attenuation in brain blood flow. 
We did it two ways. We did an ASL study, and then we thought we'd be better to do a bold study. We did a bold study. We got the same results. And what psilocybin does is it switches off brain activity in these key connector hubs, the anterior and posterior cingulate cortex. These are the nodes of the brain which integrate fun brain function, cortical function, uh, in the posterior of the visual and motor and sensory integration, and in the front, more the emotional and consciousness sort of self-awareness integration. So psilocybin dampens down the parts of the brain which orchestrate and regulate cortical function and let the brain therefore do its own thing. So it kind of liberates the brain. So you, under psilocybin you're seeing brain activity that isn't constrained in the normal way in which the brain is constrained. And we thought that was really interesting. Interesting, the referee said, oh, well, this is just an effect on blood vessels because everyone knows that these drugs change blood vessels and blood flow. I kind of thought, well... If you can change blood flow and produce these effects, that's quite interesting in itself. But never mind, yeah. We're all neuroscientists. Let's go and do, let's see what happens to neurons. So we went on and we did a MEG study. And MEG just measures the changes in electric activity in neurons through changes in magnetic dipoles, as you know, and it's got very high temporal resolution. And we found essentially the same thing this profound reduction in the power of the MEG signal across the frequency range, particularly in the posterior cingulate cortex and in these high frequencies or higher frequencies in the anterior cingulate cortex. So this, is, this confirms what we found with the BOLD and the ASL. These drugs profoundly alter the brain, but not all the brain, just these particular integrative hubs. And in fact, with MEG, we were able to do uh, a technique, use a technique called dynamic causal modeling with Carl Friston, and uh, we were able to evaluate this model of cortical function where you have a couple of pyramidal cells and a couple of interneurons which regulate them. And from the MEG signal, estimate that the predominant effect of psilocybin is on these deep layer 5 pyramidal cells. And I think that may be the first example where in a human you can actually point to an effect on brain function targeted at a particular cell type in the cortex. Just come out in Jane Neuroscience. And since T Tony Stenson's here, I wanted to just say a little bit about the psychotomimetic effects of psilocybin in this model, because there has always been this interesting idea that maybe the psychedelics mimic some forms of schizophrenia. And one other thing that was very clear in terms of the analysis of the psilocybin effect was the fact that the, in, the separation, which you normally see, a very clear separation from the default mode network, the anterior posterior singlet areas I've shown you, and the task positive network, the network which is engaged when you're doing things like giving talks, etc. And here you see, in a normal situation, there's a very clear dis distinction in terms of um, metabolic activity in these different regions. So here's the default mode, and when the default mode's up, the task positive is down, and when the task positive is up, the default's down. They're anti-phase, and that's, that's how the brain works, essentially. When you're doing things, you don't want to be reflecting on things, and when you're reflecting on things, you don't want to be doing things. And these boundaries, we thought, would maybe get broken down in psychosis. They maybe get, there's evidence here from a number of studies that this separation becomes uh, less defined in psychotic states and also in other conditions like meditation. And here's a description from one of our subjects who said, it was certainly quite different at times to know where I ended and where I melted into everything around me. So the sort of ego dissolution that you see in people with schizophrenia. And so here you see it. Oh, this is actually, no, this, is a, this is another slide that I thought would entertain some of you. Um, this is a recent study looking at separation of default mode and task positive uh, in smokers. And I guess some of you smoke. And if you take smokers in withdrawal, you have much less good differentiation of the two networks than when you give them nicotine. And I thought that was quite interesting because it explains why nicotine is useful to people who smoke because it makes, it makes their brain work in a more 
differentiated way. But it also raises this interesting question, again, for those of you interested in schizophrenia, why nicotinic agonists might be useful in schizophrenia. Because it might help separate those two networks which are uh, collapsed in schizophrenia. And here you see them collapsed under psilocybin. So here's the before the psilocybin, the antiphase, the quite good differentiation, and under psilocybin, the, the, the two systems becoming less differentiated. So this might be a model of, uh, of psychosis. In fact, we're doing a study now trying to see whether we can block this with n new antipsychotics that don't just work on the, the 5 ht 2 a receptor. But another fascinating thing emerged from this was that psilocybin switched off this part of the brain called the and the subgenual anterior cingulate. Now this is a part of the brain which is intimately involved in depression. In fact, we know that a whole range of antidepressant treatments, SSRI, CBT, ECT, switch off that part of the brain. That's the part of the brain which seems to drive depression. And we were surprised, we didn't expect that, but many of our subjects said even though they were taking this trip in a brain scanner, there were still beneficial effects on their sense of well-being for up to a few weeks later. And based on that and this, this, the parallelity with these other studies, we've got funding now to do a trial of psilocybin in depression. Now, again, you would never have thought of that doing that, I think, unless you'd actually had this evidence of the brain changes being meaningful in that disorder. And I want to finish by talking about this trial. Did, any, did it get onto Swedish TV? Did any of you see this? Yeah. So this is, a, this is a, a rather remarkable study. This was a study we did f for Channel 4, the, the uh, UK TV program. And um, the reason we did it for the TV was because I couldn't get funding from anywhere else to do this study. No one's interested in studying illegal drugs. Most funders, particularly charities, are scared of, the, of getting labelled as working with druggies and working with people outside the law. But Channel 4 were, were amenable. The truth is, they asked me to do a study on TV of cocaine. And I said, I'm not interested. I know what it does. It's been done in America. And they went away, and after two weeks, they came back and said, well, what would you do? And I said, I'll do MDMA. So we did. Why did we do MDMA? We did MDMA because MDMA is the most promising treatment for chronic PTSD, treatment-resistant PTSD. And PTSD is a massive problem in society. It's a particularly big problem in societies where, that are at war. And this is an amazing statistic. More American soldiers have killed themselves since they've come back from Iraq and Afghanistan than have died in combat. And they've done it. they killed themselves because they're so psychologically damaged by the experience of either killing people randomly or being blown up or seeing their friends blown up by uh, improvised explosive devices. And the treatments we have for PTSD are rather poor. But MDMA offers a new approach. And this is a very important study published a couple of years ago uh, by a group in California and what they did was they took people who were still suffering from PTSD despite classic treatment and they randomized them to a psychotherapeutic intervention with placebo or a psychotherapeutic intervention in which they were given two doses of MDMA a week apart as part of a therapy session. So we're not giving MDMA every day, we're giving just two exposures. And they found the ones who had the psychotherapy under MDMA, about 80% went into remission, having been treatment resistant. Now that is a very powerful effect, and it's worth exploring whether that might be achieved through other means than MDMA, but also understanding why MDMA might do it. And in fact, the effect is long-lasting, so the year follow-up showed the ones who got better, all but one stayed well. So if we can really get people out of chronic trauma using a drug like MDMA, that would, could be a very major gain in terms of the treatment of these disorders. And so I was therefore interested to know what MDMA did in the brain, because no one had ever studied it in the, in the way that we studied psilocybin. And here's the data. It's not yet published. But what you can see is that the, the first thing is to say, again, like with psilocybin, there was no area of the brain where there was an increase in activation. All the changes are, are, are blue. They're all 
there are all reductions in brain activity or brain blood flow following MDMA. The second thing you can see is they're in very different regions to those we saw reduced under psilocybin. These are subcortical effects, largely, of MDMA. And in fact, if you look at, say, the amygdala, you see the magnitude, the greater the switch off of the amygdala, the greater the sense of, um, this is a measure of intensity of drug effects, positive drug effects under MDMA. So what MDMA seems to be doing is switching off limbic systems. And that's presumably why it disengages people from, from their trauma or their traumatic memories. And we were able to show that if we looked at people's bad memories, now these, these are normal controls, they don't have PTSD, but we were able to get them to relive negative experiences in their life. And we uh, presume that, that one of the benefits of MDMA might well be to allow people to relive the, the trauma of PTSD without having the severe dissociation that they often get when they try to re-engage with the trauma and get cognitive control. So we, we predicted and we were pleased to see that, in fact, MDMA did attenuate the negative emotions. Uh, it did also increase positive memories. But this is what we were uh, looking for. We thought maybe there would, this would be justification for using MDMA in psychotherapeutic settings. And we were able then to show that these effects of MDMA to, to reduce traumatic or bad memories were um, due to alterations in blood flow in the posterior cingulate and the insula. So, so we think now we have at least some the beginnings of a, an understanding of the brain circuitry on which MDMA works, which may potentially help us develop it, or maybe alternative drugs uh, as therapies. And, uh, and alternative drugs would be a really interesting strategy. We have identified quite a few potential MDMA analogues, which could have a greater safety margin than, than MDMA. The problem is, as we identify them, our government systematically bans them, just in case they might leak out to people uh, who want to use them for fun. And in fact, we've, we've met a problem a bit like the Catholic Church back for the days of Galileo. And here, this is so, this is an elected representative of a of our people, maybe able to make laws in Parliament, who's actively seeking to stop our research. And the theory behind it, I think, I don't know what, I don't know kind of why he's doing this, but I think, the, I think it's really, the, the clue is here. Why was Professor Nutt allowed to use an illegal drug? And, and this, is a, this exemplifies the problems of egality. People cannot be rational when something's illegal. And that's why we have to be very, very cautious about making anything illegal, because it stops the way people think. That's why we should not give criminal records to young people for possessing cannabis, because it labels them for life as criminals. And people cannot be rational about things that are illegal. So we have to minimize the spread of illegality through our society. I want to finish by um, coming back to a Swedish model. And I, I've been fascinated by snus. I like the way in which you have taken the problem of tobacco and reasoned that if you could make a safe tobacco, you would have major health benefits. And snus is unquestionably one of the great success stories in terms of drugs of abuse there's ever been. And based on that, I've been thinking, why don't we do the same for alcohol? And I could. I have identified at least four compounds which would be credible surrogates for alcohol. They would be free of the liver toxicity, the heart toxicity, the brain toxicity, and you'd have an antidote. So you could go to a party, have fun, take the antidote, drive home safely. <laughs> now, you know, this is within the realm of modern neuroscience. It's actually not difficult. So why doesn't it happen? And it doesn't happen because investors are terrified that this drug would fall foul of those people who want to make things illegal to stop young people having fun. And therefore, it hasn't yet happened. But maybe if any of you in the audience have got a nice 
supply of cash, we could take it forward. <laughs> Maybe this is the country, you know, the, this is the rational country to, to develop a safe alcohol. Uh, I'd like to think so, and uh, do see me afterwards if you want to take it forward. So. <laughs> I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish by plugging my book. This is a book which tells what I think is the truth about drugs in a very uh, simple way. It's a book which is designed for the general public, so you can buy it for your parents for Christmas, and then you can read it yourself. Uh, uh, and all the proceeds go to a charity I've set up called um, the ISCD, which tries to tell the truth about drugs and educate people about the way in which the drug laws actually are seriously damaging, not just to drug users, but also to scientists. So thank you very much.